everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Shweta Sooth and I'm the head of programs at 50 by 40. And I'm going to be your host for today for the session titled Adjust That Stock Transition in Asia, a Human Rights and a Health Perspective. A quick intro into 50 by 40. So 50 by 40 is a global collective impact organization that aims to bring down the global production as well as consumption of all animals by 50% by the year 2040. We are a networking organization, which means that we are a convener of 70 plus partners, as well as a vast network of allies. And together through our partner network and our allies, we have curated a global call for a just livestock transition, especially in international uh, fora, such as the UN Food System Summit. Uh, and just to kind of quote from that, a powerful example of what we've been able to do is that one of the key outcomes of last year's UN Food System Summit was the inclusion of Just Livestock Transition as a solution. Um, like I said, today's session, we aim to bring the conversation on what does this transition look like within Asia, uh, with a particular focus on public health and human rights, which is so important when you talk about Asia. We have an amazing panel of experts to speak to the different facets of this and what could be potential steps forward on the scene. What exactly do we mean when we talk about a just livestock transition? So essentially what we mean when we say a just livestock transition is that it is a shift away from the most unsustainable forms of livestock production to a form of production that is more climate compatible with the agricultural system and one that supports a global equitable food production and distribution. Um, a, a just livestock transition in itself is a fairly new concept. Uh, however, we can learn from transitions that have happened in other sectors, such as the energy sector. Um, a just livestock transition will, however, come with its own unique challenges. For one thing, the scale of the agricultural industry is very different. So as a quick example, we had about 20 million people that were working in the energy sector and within the livestock sector, that number is into five times. So we have more than 1 billion people that work on, on, on the agricultural sector alone. So the nuances of such a transition would be very different. But as the nuances would be different, so will the benefits. Uh, a transition like this would positively impact climate change and adaptation and mitigation efforts. It would involve better public and human health, uh, not to mention it would cause uh, far better, better greener jobs, more resilient economies, especially in the local context. So that was just a quick intro into what the session about of today is going to be like. We should now maybe open it up to the panelists. And the first panelist we have with us today is Vince Charles. Vince will be, will be setting the stage by presenting the key highlights from the Just Protein Transition Summit that was co-organized by World Animal Protection and 50 by 40 recently. Um, Vince is currently the interim head of global campaigns at World Animal Protection. Uh, and he's leading the implementation and delivery of the global campaigns of farm animal welfare. So over to you, Vince. Thank you so much, Sweta. Um, I am pleased to, to share to you key highlights from the Just Protein Transition in Asia. Uh, Pathways to COP27 and Beyond Summit, uh, which was organized by 50 by 40 and World Animal Protection uh, last March 28 to March 30 this year. Um, basically, the main objective of that summit was to was was to bring uh, bring together various stakeholders, aim at uniting civil society actors working across protein system in Asia. So that we'll be able to co-create a shared vision for a just, sustainable, and humane food system. And at the same time, we are going to bring that voice of the Global South to the UNF Tripoxy Forum and highlight what the just protein transition can look like in a region as unique as Asia. Um, in the weeks leading up to the summit, um, our representatives from 40 regional civil societies working on climate change, public health, finance, smallholder, Human rights and consumers' rights um, came together uh, to map out negative impacts of how the current system of producing protein uh, on, the, on different thematic areas and be able to identify potential pathways for a shift forward uh, towards a just humane and sustainable protein system in Asia. At the pre summit conversation, uh, we explored problems by looking at root causes and effects of our broken protein system. 
uh, uh, we did system mapping, we looked at stakeholders, and we identified drivers for change. Of course, my focus today is on human rights and health, which are, of course, strongly interlinked. Um, during the PSE or the pre-summit conversation on health, uh, basically it showed how the collusion of big ag, uh, industrial farming, factory farming, and governments has resulted to weak regulations, lack in meat production, and consumption with subsidies. Uh, it also resulted to focus on vo volume, not quality, basically resulting to overproduction and marketing of cheap meats, consequently leading to chronic diseases, obesity, habitat destruction, zoonosis, antibiotics overuse, and AMR. During the conversation, we identified stakeholders driving the problems or are maintaining the status quo, which are factory farms, low-income country governments orientated towards import-based and role of trade powers, including pharmaceutical companies. Um, we also identified consumers who have seen the cultural value of meat or consumers who have less power compared to consumers in big countries who don't feel strongly in invested in poor countries, even less in animals. But at the same time, uh, there's opportunities for change in looking at younger consumers who are exposed to trends, such as uh, safe food policy, diversified protein sources, and links to food systems to public health. In addition, of or movement of critical to create more of one health and one welfare. During the pre-summit conversation, human rights um, basically affirm the monopoly or increasing power of factory farming uh, resulting to overproduction based on profit resulting to an even distribution and access to protein. A monopoly further uh, constrict remaining space for smallholders to scale up and compete. Uh, we also highlighted how the current food system has opened up new vulnerabilities in food production value chains of different groups who are already experience, experiencing marginalization, who are forced to work with little legal protection and knowledge of exploitation. Basically, this results to food riots and uprising due to land conversion, lack of access to food, violation of rights, experiencing direct and indirect risks from environmental problems and zoonosis. Consequently, putting additional pressure on social welfare system for the marginalized. Um, the current food systems um, we've identified have put consumers, animals, small and medium enterprises, and smallholders and developing countries at the losing end. However, within these, we've seen the role of farmers who are informed and empowered to start the shift to a new system of protein production but this needs to be coupled with changes in consumer preference, scaling up of social entrepreneurs, community mobilizations, and transparency in products and production, including we've identified the role of media in that. So um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the pre-summit conversation helped tailor and focus the summit and agenda and in shaping the Asia protein communique, which is directed towards the UNF, C and member countries. And of course, uh, since the communique is one of the output to that, uh, we can share the link to you in, in the chat. So this is just a snapshot of what uh, for, from that summit. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Vince, for, for sharing your views and presenting that to us. Um, I do think it is important that this this work that we're doing uh, towards the transition, um, and and thank you for sharing your views on that as well as kind of co collaborating with us on that project. Um, we have now with us Kate Plasak, who is the director of Protein Transition at Asia Research and Engagement. Uh, Kate leads ARE's protein transition work across Asia on responsible animal agriculture as well as sustainable alternative proteins. Uh, she'll be speaking on the future of zoonotic diseases and pandemics and their relationship to factory farming. Over to you, Kate. Thanks very much, Shweta. Uh, and thanks for inviting ARE to speak at this uh, important forum. So essentially, uh, I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, ARE and what we do. Uh, with investor-backed engagement of companies, 
uh, we have certainly an objective to ask companies to work towards a protein transition in line with some investor agreed 2030 vision and goals that we're developing. The sectors that we target are usually the producer companies, manufacturers, retailers, et cetera. And we use a range of things from meetings to AGM attendance and then uh, voting analysis and, and so forth, and even media. We are small, so we must collaborate. And essentially we collaborate with um, major institutional investors. And of course, we're very happy to collaborate with other relevant NGOs, et cetera. So key, some key facts and figures around pandemics. Uh, well, 75% of emerging diseases in humans in the past 30 years did arise from animals, causing around 1 billion illnesses annually. And we know that ag and livestock drivers alone are associated with greater than 50% of zoonoses, diseases which pass from animals to humans. Before even COVID-19, the total cost of uh, epidemics in Asia was around 200 billion US dollars, or around 0.9% of the region's GDP. And of course, with covid uh, the poverty was exacerbated further. But I just want to also raise around the hidden pandemic and the multiplier effects. And not many people realize that 75% of, of the world's antibiotics are used in farm animals. This leads to um, antimicrobial resistance, which is also found along the food chain and the animal protein chain. It leads to deaths now, but are those that are projected to rise to about 10 million per year. There are significant costs, as the World Bank has uh, projected, and also pandemics lead to, uh, even viral pandemics, lead to higher levels of antibiotic use, as we see uh, whether they're on farm or in the human population, and we know climate change will increase these risks. And also comorbidities or non-communicable disease are often linked to heavy meat diseases or diets. So just very quickly, um, a bit of it around pandemics and how they're cycling and how that relates also to industrial farms. And look, I could have got one of the academic um, graphics, but actually I found that many of them were missing something and I'll explain. So first of all, most pandemics do arise from uh, forest and wildlife can be exacerbated by hunting of wildlife and, and so forth. There's disease overspill into farms, farms that are increasingly encroaching uh, on wild areas, deforestation, land use changes. This leads to uh, a disease reservoir in a high number of animals, high density, they're under high stress, they're mixing and under low welfare conditions. That in addition to rapid building uh, and restocking of industries uh, also leads to increase in factory farms. Disease uh, becomes amplified, mixes and mutates and we get new strains of disease, spills over then into the human and further animal populations which are transported then, of course, if it leads to other countries, we then call it a pandemic. But what wasn't really usually in the uh, cycles I saw published was actually this on spill where we get new variants, new strains, and we see the cycle uh, continue again. Some really good examples are avian influenza, uh, and they it originally occurred in typical industrial meat chicken farming uh, contexts. And now, of course, there's a spill over back into wildlife wild birds, etc., and then new strains, which are now found still all around the world. And then on the right, we see after African swine fever, a pandemic that is not affecting humans. There's a cycle of rapid industrial expansion and consolidation of pig farms after the pandemic. So we see these multi-storey mega pig farms in China in particular, and, and you can clearly see they encroach on wild areas. So in summary of the linkages to factory farming, we know factory farming is the largest driver of deforestation and land use changes. We know that it is the largest driver of water use and waste production and pollution. We know it contributes to breaching the four, at least four planetary boundaries already. And it's the second largest producer of greenhouse gases, driving climate change and together increasing the risks of pandemics as noted by UNEP in 2020. All this system, as Vince says, per perpetuates the cheap meat, poor diet and health cycle and increasing comorbidities of exacerbated COVID-19 effects, as we know. Factory farming has very poor welfare and biosecurity internally, overcrowding, barren environments, genetically uniform animals that are highly stressed with low immunity, rapid intensification, et cetera. Wet markets and live transport also perpetuate disease and insect vectors could be an interesting um, challenge further. We certainly know Asia is a global hotspot and the perfect pandemic storm where the collusion of environmental, human um, and uh, 
societal factors come into play, environmental. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, actually, there's a couple of papers that started to predict. They think the most likely scenario for the next pandemic is probably a, a variation of some sort of bird flu, influenza virus, or another coronavirus. And that's uh, a, certainly an agreement between various experts. But also, because we weren't particularly well prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that's going to be a future prediction if we're not better prepared. Where might these happen? Well, they don't know exactly, but certainly it's going to be somewhere where there's the close interaction of people and either farm and domesticated animals, likely perhaps in southern China or Mexico, um, but also for animal pandemics, probably again in China and South Korea, where they're still bubbling along. So <clears throat> what can we do to sort of get out of this intractable situation? One Health, it's been around since the 1940s, um, certainly provides a platform, a framework for the integration of human, animal and environmental health, but also considering it and ensuring that includes wildlife and addressing the need for a clean environment. We know that there's a tripartite and now a quadripartite, quadripartite that was just recently formalised with UNFAO, World Health Organisation, World Organisation for Animal Health and the UN Environmental Programme. And this is now essential to work together. We also know that there's aspects of one welfare. So we know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, many social aspects that were challenging are not really included entirely in the One Health uh, framework. So we'd encourage a, a, a more expansive um, framework. And we know definitely that the UNEP and others have identified animal welfare as a key part of that nexus. Another key opportunity, of course, is the WHO Inter International Instrument on Pandemic Preparedness, Prevention and Response. It's currently in draft and um, going through further consultation. It's a fantastic initiative, but there's still some way to ensure that the One Health definition is consistent with that of the quadripartite and other aspects to tackle the root causes of the, of the situation. And of course, we know this is all leading up towards COP27, where we can start talking more about food systems, factory farming and climate change. So in conclusion, a just protein in transition in Asia is essential. Um, WHO are already starting to talk about the benefits of plant-based diets and other um, publishers. We know that there are great motivations in Asia driven by health, to some degree sustainability and novelty, along with taste and access and price. We know there's a lot of Asian benefits and there are many Asian hubs working in alternative proteins, both plant-based and cell-based. And emerging are some uh, countries incorporating this into policy support. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kate, for that lovely presentation. I do think One Health as a concept, especially integrating like human and animal health, and I think is something we need to talk about. And I'd love to kind of speak more about antimicrobial resistance if uh, we get the time to. Um, so thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, we also have with us Gwena Subramanian, who is from the Institute of Human Rights and Businesses. Um, Gwena coordinates the Asia's regional migrant workers, oceans and just transition programs. Uh, and prior to his current role, he conducted research on forced labor and human trafficking in fishing vessels. Uh, he will be speaking today on the impact of a just livestock transition on human rights. And so over to you, Gunnar. Thank you, Shweta. And thanks for having IHRB on this panel. And hello, everyone. The Institute for Human Rights and Business, IHRB, uh, we are a nonprofit think tank. We work on human rights issues uh, facing business. We're not activists, we're not corporate cheerleaders, but we are critical associates and friends. We work on trust and dialogue with business, government and civil society. We share our research as public goods. Um, so our work involves raising standards and encouraging best practice across various sectors and industries. So today I'll try to give a sort of broad overview of what just transitions could mean for the livestock sectors, the workers and uh, people effect, uh, impacted. Um, so as this task ahead of us is one of decarbonizing to build a cleaner, greener world, but while we are at it, a fairer one as well. And even before COVID, numerous intergovernmental reports showed that the most corrosive impacts within and between economies was growing inequality. We are living in a deeply unequal world as well as an overcarbonized one. And those things together put justice right at the heart of the economic transitions needed to achieve net zero. 
be it the energy sector or livestock. There is already a fair bit of discussion on transitions in energy, but no sector is unaffected in the transition to a low carbon economy. And that includes sectors within food production, be it animal agri agriculture or aquaculture and so on. In terms of what just transitions are, it has been defined over the years in a variety of ways from approaches integrating procedural and distributive justice for more structural reform by workers unions all the way through to really transformative approaches that envision a complete overhaul of the political and economic systems that are really seen as driving the climate and uh, inequality crisis. We are at this point where there's tremendous uh, uptake of a very uh, visionary concept, but not yet with a really single definition. So until there are clear norms and standards around it, I think uh, uh, the best to think of it as a pathway first to uh, really think ambitiously about the outcomes we are collectively targeting, uh, low or zero emissions, um, guaranteed social protections, decent work for all, poverty elimination and thriving and resilient communities. And then work backwards from that to chart your path as a company policymaker or other stakeholder as part of a wider ecosystem of actors as well. And what that part should be to make the concept of justice within this conversation real. To dial a, a bit more, uh, summarize here six points that could be considered essential elements to think about. Firstly, uh, context and uh, a risk to people approach, not limiting your focus only to workers ensuring your planning is integrated as well as holistic and sharing your learnings. In the interest of time, I'll just touch on just two or three elements. First on context, um, every transition is going to be multi-dimensional. Transitions will be happening at different times, at different levels and different rates requiring action from a concert of different actors. So just transition is really a contested space and it should be because every transition is going to have local history and politics forming the backdrop. So it is all about practice on the ground. No one is looking for more lofty uh, commitments or nice words on paper. We really want to see the hard, quiet work on the ground of trust building with potentially affected stakeholders, really asking yourself the question constantly, what it means for those stakeholders, including workers, to have agency in the decision-making processes um, that are going to transform their lives. Secondly, uh, preventing risk is an essential first. So just transition is not just a matter of creating new jobs, reskilling or ad hoc local programs. Uh, first and foremost, a risk to people approach must be embedded deeply into a business or companies, culture systems and relationships. The UN guiding principles for business and human rights, the UNGPs uh, already provide the established uh, global baseline here. The bottom line is unless you continually assess your risk, your involvement and take appropriate action, we're just trading one crisis for another uh, climate action for social breakdown. I'll skip to the fourth and last point I'll make here, um, the full spectrum of uh, transition. This is not just a transition for the livestock sector. The transition in is very much the other half of the transition coin. For example, the alternative protein sector is slowly gaining traction. And just because it is a greener solution doesn't mean that there are low or no impacts on communities and workers. With livestock, seafood, uh, agriculture, uh, 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 and other industries, we have, there have been various labor and human rights issues over the years from uh, wage withholding or poor working conditions and migrant worker exploitation and more severely human, tra human trafficking and forced labor situations. So it is important to acknowledge that Transition in actors are not immune from such, pro such, from such problems. We need to ensure the same problem, problems are not recreated again. So for the out and the in transition, it needs to be a holistic uh, approach. I'll leave it there shorter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gunnar. That was an, a really interesting introduction, especially I think when we talk about like, what does it mean to trust build and what does it mean to, uh, have trust building at the ground level and then how we kind of scale those things up. I think that's something we we will, I'd love to chat more about. Um, and I think picking up from like the human rights aspect of a just transition, any conversation around food systems in Asia would be incomplete without speaking about smallholder farmers. 
Um, and to speak more to uh, this, we have with us Pushkar, who is a project advisor for Urvarasa, uh, a farmer's empowerment program of an organization called Jeev Bhavna that helps farmers transition from chemical animal-based agriculture to more natural and plant-based practices. So I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Pushkar. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Great. All right. Then. Hello, everyone. Uh, so at Jeeva Bhavna, uh, our focus is to ensure that the farmers in India, doesn't matter if it's the marginal, small marginal farmers or, you know, farmers with hundreds of acres of land, but all of them together, put together, uh, own a sizable lot of land in the country. And this is the land that should actually be put to use as a carbon sink. How do we do that? The problem that the country, I'm sure it's, it's pretty much the same in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh as well, that uh, post-independence, somewhere around 1947 or so, our entire focus was on uh, building big dams, on the green revolution, white revolution followed suit. So the focus was primarily on what is, you know, pretty much visible on the surface and what the West was doing and all of that. Uh, this drove the small and marginal farmers and, and the traditional life, you know, the uh, village uh, practices. It, it drove the farmers towards this industrialized form of agriculture and then ultimately to animal agriculture. What we have been doing of what we've been trying to do is we are going the other way around. We start with the consumer. We start with the consumer because the consumer has the potential to spend money. He's anyway spending money on, you know, buying everything that is being marketed to him. So if the consumer and there, there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, conscious consumers, there are people, the, the awareness is as uh, and Guna rightly pointed out, it's, it's there. It's not like it's not there. But the only problem is that uh, people do not believe that they can actually drive the change. They are still relying on government and they're still relying on policy makers to do something about it. An average consumer can very much, you know, bring about the change for, I don't know, about 10 families easily because he just has to tie up. And that is, that is what we are focusing on. We are asking consumers to tie up with farmers doesn't matter how small small or big is land holding but we want and we are working uh, to create farmer consumer cooperatives we have been doing this in a small city of pune for the past 9 years where farmers who are practicing natural farming chemical free natural farming uh, they are not uh, as dependent on their cattle and we are uh, you know helping them transition towards cattle free farming so these farmers and consumers together have formed cooperatives wherein the prices are fixed. And that is, let's, let's not forget that the farmer is more concerned with whether and how he's going to make money. It doesn't matter if it's plant-based. It doesn't matter if it's animal agriculture. The, the plight of the Indian farmer today is that he, there's, there's no one looking out for him. There's no one who's got his back. So the farmer has no choice but to look out for himself and that is what is driving him towards uh, monocropping and animal agriculture and you know everything that comes with it so and one more uh, although you know we're strapped for time but uh, one crucial aspect that i would want to add here is that uh, india is the largest abstractor of groundwater in the world more than us and china combined and although we would like to think that the green revolution, uh, you know, is a result of all the dams that we've built, it is, you know, sadly the other way around. It is the groundwater that is actually uh, catering to most of our uh, agricultural needs. And sadly, that water is again being used for monocropping, which is, you know, being fed to, you know, which which comes into play in dairy farming and 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 poultry and everything else. So that is actually, and, and I think we have enough data, all of us know this, that, you know, we have overproduction on one hand, but, you know, severe poverty and, you know, uh, malnutrition on one, on the other side. So 
as far as india is concerned the the way forward that we see as jeeva bhavana and punarbharan foundation is that farmers and consumers have to come together they have to form cooperatives wherein the consumers actually do the part that the government is lacking which is they have to have a river basin or a watershed approach that no no one is thinking about this because it's the groundwater that is actually you know uh, pulling the indian agriculture forward not the not the surface water not the big dam not the big deep lakes and all all of that it's the groundwater so unless and until consumers tie up with farmers and ask them that you know this is this is the carrying capacity of your watershed this is the carrying capacity of our entire you know river basin that we are all collectively a part of and this is what we want you to grow they can be millets they can be fruits whatever whatever that micro watershed or that macro watershed can withstand you know good rains bad rains it, they should be able to sustain for the for 3 to 5 years unless and until that happens we are looking at a very 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 uh, scary picture this year itself the uh, the weather department of the government of india claims that we've had above average rainfall well we can certainly see that in pakistan but <laughs> we we seen that it it's been a series of cloud bursts and at the same time we are seeing hundreds of districts across the country especially in india that they do not have enough water they don't even have enough water in the dams and that dam water is essentially going to have to be let out for hydroelectricity generation and you know for the industries and what not so we are you know already in the middle of a great food and water crisis animal agriculture is is a match stick on 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 that pile of gunpowder so the way forward is to work extensively on making the consumers aware because they are the ones who are going to drive this drive this change the farmers we do target farmers but there's only a handful of farmers who actually have the capacity to move away from lucrative opportunities that you know supposedly lucrative opportunities that animal agriculture offers it you know it's it's like sugarcane farming in india it it give it's it's a it's a notion that it's going to provide them uh, a short income same goes for animal agriculture so it's the consumers who will have to go to the farmers they'll have to you know tell them that you know look we are in this together we'll have to you know work together you need an assured market we have it we we are your consumers so why don't you sell us to sell it sell to us directly and we've been doing this in the city of pune for the past 8 years so that's that's about it from my side i'll be happy to answer questions thank you guys for allowing us to present our part over here thank you so much thank you so much pushkar always good to hear uh, of like what's happening at the grassroots level and also to see how we can how there are like cooperatives that are kind of building a change at that level and i think we've kind of tried to track this problem from like a large you know how we talk at international fora to what is the research say about pandemics to what is the human rights uh, side of this conversation to of course what is the small hole to have to say and we've kind of focused on asia so far that has been our idea however we also think that it is important to see how does all of this add up for us in a global perspective and to kind of tie this in and to shed more light on this we have our final uh, speaker for the day who is cleo from the stockholm environmental institute uh Cleo is a researcher at uh, SEI and her research focuses largely on the legal and political dimensions of the UN sustainable development uh, and climate change policy uh, as well as on uh, what do just and healthy dietary transitions look like along with animal welfare so i'm going to pass it over to you Cleo Thanks Shweta and thank you to 50 by 40 for convening this important discussion Uh, so as Shweta was saying, my work focuses on the need for dietary transitions more at a global level, and I'll be sharing a few brief reflections from this that I think are relevant for today's discussions. And thank you for the to the other panelists for their really interesting insights um, from Asia. So first, just to underline that the need to transition diets is real and it's urgent. As we've heard today, it needs to happen for public health, food security. 
climate and biodiversity, as well as anim animal welfare reasons. And actually, any of these issues alone should be sufficient cause for pause and for us to consider shifts in the way that we produce and consume food. Together, they constitute a compelling case for urgent action. Nevertheless, the issue remains relatively neglected in policy. For instance, none of the nationally determined contributions submitted under the Paris Agreement even discuss the need for dietary change. At the same time, I think it's very important to recognize how the consumption of meat and other animal products is highly inequitably distributed. Many places do need to significantly reduce their intake of animal products, but certain countries and population groups that face food insecurity could currently benefit from increases in animal pro product consumption, at least until they gain access to alternatives. In other words, whilst we do need this global reduction, we need national and local nuance to go with it. And just like in the energy space, the picture is differentiated. When it comes to Asia, we of course know the region holds tremendous dietary, socioeconomic and cultural diversity, both between and within countries. Nevertheless, it is the world's largest meat producer overall and accounts for around 40 to 45% of total meat production. Meat production in the region has increased a staggering 15 fold since 1960 and it's expected to grow further. These figures do indicate that something needs to change in particular, as we heard earlier, with regard to industrial livestock practices, given the significant health and environmental impacts of these industries. So I come from the Netherlands, um, and you might have seen that the country is uh, currently facing large scale protests and significant societal tensions as a result of a government decision that livestock numbers be cut by, 20, by 30% by 2030 from 2019 levels. That's mostly for environmental reasons. These changes are particularly painful since the government knew for decades that the country's livestock production was unsustainable and yet for many years farmers were encouraged to increase their outputs. Similarly, the EU as a whole is now discovering that it's unlikely to meet its global methane pledge without cuts in the number of farmed animals. In the Netherlands, the protests uh, of farmers against the Dutch uh, measures that are being announced and introduced are fu fueling societal divisions and they are also being used by populists, uh, politicians in the Netherlands, other parts of Europe, as well as the US, to agitate against climate policies generally. Like look, look what can go wrong and look how people can lose their jobs when governments take the environment seriously. So we need to avoid making these same mistakes elsewhere by locking in unsustainable food systems for too long, where, after which a very radical and unjust transition is needed. So all of this in with intentionality, we can create a more gradual shift in production and consumption, one that minimizes disruption and increases benefits, one that avoids stranded assets and helps to build buy-in and support for a more sustainable and healthy future. As Guna was saying in his intervention, just transition is incredibly localized and context specific. Um, but nevertheless, um, I, I do think there are some key principles that are worth bearing in mind for those countries and regions uh, of which we know that they need to start transitioning away from animal uh, products. So I just like to highlight four of those. First is that um, governments need to phase down their support for industrial animal farming and increase support for sustainable alternatives. Should um, shift the money and the policies to what we what we want to achieve and away from um, current industries that are detrimental to health and environment. We need to ensure uh, inclusive and participatory planning processes. Third, uh, and to the extent possible, we need to minimize and address adverse impacts through support. And this could be both dom domestic and international support in, in line with principles of international equity. And finally, we need to be intentional about the future food system we build so that alternative systems safeguard equity, health and sustainability. And a, a couple of other speakers have already mentioned it, but I do really think that we can hold newer actors in the food system to account in that regard. For instance, these newer technologies, alternatives to meat um, that are currently gaining traction 
we can be vocal towards these industries that they need to ensure decent jobs, healthier products, and deliver on sustainability promises. So that's it from me and looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Cleo. I think that was a wonderful introduction. Um, we will now be going into the, um, the moderated uh, uh, panel discussion. I'm just gonna try and put people into spotlight. So just give me one second. Um, I hope like that's the view for everyone and not just for me. Um, one second, I'm trying to look for, uh, I can't see um, Vince in the room. Let me just, sorry, apologies, just give me one second. Oh yeah, okay, I can see now, all right. Oh, perfect, all right, thank you. All right, so now that all of us are here, I wanted to first make a quick uh, announcement and say that for people, we will still be doing questions on Slido, so please do enter any questions you have up with the questions that are there already. Uh, the link is right there in the chat. Um, and before and before we go into Slido, I just wanted to ask a few questions to the people who are present here. And Cleo, since we finished with you, I wanted to maybe start with you as well, because it's fresh in my mind right now. I think you made a mention to the issue of stranded assets in, in transitions. And I think I understand what that means generally, but I'm keen to understand from a livestock perspective, what would those stranded assets be and how could we potentially utilize them in, in any way, if at all? Sure, thanks. Um, so there is interesting research that being done specifically around stranded uh, assets in the livestock sector. Um, and I, this is highlighting sort of the, the various risks that are associated with livestock farming and especially industrial livestock farming, including related to health um, and environment, which might suggest that for investors, ultimately, it's not as good as, as an investment as might be expected because of those uh, risks associated with these investments. So the, the real risk for, uh, for governments, but also companies, individuals in this kind of current moment is, is making investments um, in a sector uh, that might not have a future in, in the way that it has now. And we already know that quite clearly from the fossil fuels discussions where you invest in infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of upfront investment at the start, and then you want to use that in fossil fuel infrastructure to the net for the next 40 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and th that makes it much harder actually to transition away from fossil fuels because once these actors have made these investments, uh, they're sort of locked into those uh, fossil fuel uh, pathways, development pathways. And we face the same risks with uh, the livestock industry if, uh, if farmers and governments uh, invest heavily in increasing that industry, increasing the outputs like they were doing in the Netherlands, and then having to sh shutter and shut down these industries um, before that would be economically the case if these environmental and health aspects were in such a challenge. Right. Thank you for sharing that. I think I've always kind of understood it within, I, I guess it was easier to understand in the realm of uh, solar, the solar energy sector, but I think I, I see what you mean by it, like its transition um, in the livestock sector as well. Um, Vince, if I could ask you like a more kind of uh, global question, I guess, uh, given that we we kind of worked with different stakeholders, which stakeholders do you think, uh, you know, are most crucial to engage with uh, when we're talking about a just livestock transition, specifically in Asia um, and I, versus a global transition? So Vince, over to you. I think you're on mute. Sorry, yes. technical. Sorry, sorry, technical problem. Nice. Um, um, I I think there's really um at at first I think we really need to recognize the the difference between the global north and then the global south, uh, not just in terms of you know not just in terms of dynamics, but at the same time in terms of uh, in terms of consumption. Uh, uh, for example, most of the low uh, meat consuming countries are located in the global south, but at the same time, these countries are at the most disadvantaged in the context of impacts brought about by factory farming. While at the same time, the global north, uh, they may be shifting towards, you know, a, a more holistic, uh, uh, diversified 
uh, protein, but at the same time, the global no south is basically still producing for the global north. And then they have more capacity in terms of adapting to that. So I think this, this, this is an important context, but at the same time, in terms of actors, um, it, it's really important to, 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 for us to, to build a, a movement, a, a groundswell of people, particularly for those greatly disadvantaged, but who are among those. And I think on the other hand, as mentioned a while ago, uh, consumers have, um, have basically have the power because in terms of, uh, in terms of food access, some of, some of the consumers don't have even have access to, to daily protein needs or requirements. So some of these, and at the same time, um, you know, channeling this power to really target some of the big, uh, big, big companies. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that uh, there needs to be a good mix in terms of approaches, but at the same time, engaging governments or policymakers, it might take a long time, but this, uh, it will be good for us to, to identify on the immediate what we want to achieve. So what we can deliver as consumers at the same time, linking it to the bigger uh, global movement to push for and overhauling the the current food systems that you know that brought us in the first place with, with the current problem thanks vince i think that also brings me to a very interesting question that i think i had for pushkar um which was that i think when we speak about consumer awareness and how consumers and farmers can work with one another uh, i think it's so important but at the same time i often worry about scale then because you know i feel like how will we how will we reach a place where we really are able to kind of reach any um, conceivable, scale, conceivable, scalable kind of figures and change uh, through through kind of um, you know how how do we get consumer awareness to build scale? I think that is my question. Um, yeah, so if if you could shed light on that, Pushkar. Yeah, so ask ask any uh, urban dweller in India what what uh, you know what what is his biggest uh, worry today. It's either going to be water shortage or flooding. And we'll have to, you know, we, we are trying to work very hard to make these very people understand it is their food choices, it is their habits that is actually leading to all of this globally, not just in India. And believe me, it, it takes time, but you have to put it in this context. Today, if you ask someone, you know, not in in the Uttar Pradesh or somewhere in Maharashtra, people don't have enough water to drink in cities. Why is right. that? Right. Why is that? They don't know. They feel you know there's some kind of mismanagement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's been you know it's been in the making for decades. Right. It's not something that has happened you know just over the past ten or twenty years. It has been in the making for the last six, seven, eight decades. And that is how you know. You, See, this this is the challenge that we face. You know, it's I I personally feel that you know it'll perhaps take people a very short time to understand the impact of animal agriculture. But you know what goes on to it. You know what goes into it. The 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 resource. You know, animal agriculture is extremely resource intensive. This part is very nicely hidden. Mm -hmm. People don't understand that we are not you know, compensating not just the farmers, but we are not compensating anyone for, you know, even for not doing something. Like, you know, there are there are villages who, you know, refrain from expanding their farms. Do we pay them any ecological, you know, pay them for the ecological services that they offer us? We don't. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, in a country like India, the cities are just exploding as of now, vertically, horizontally. So what what can we do? Yes, the first first very important step, and I think we are, you know uh, we'll we'll have to uh, look at it as an opportunity. The water crisis, the you know the growing water crisis, we'll have to use it to make people understand as to wh what has actually led to this water crisis. Right. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Thanks. Thanks, Pushkar. I think uh, kind of building on that. Uh, that that premise is gonna also because I think you spoke and I completely agree with you on how every movement has to have like context and like has to be a groundswell and you know there is trust building that is required and I you know as someone who's who believes so passionately in movement building I totally understand what you're saying but I think the same the same 
at what level does a just transition happen? Does it happen at the level of a city? Does it happen at the level of a region? Does it happen at the level of a country? Or how how, how do we kind of talk about a just transition? Um, is it a society? So if you could shed some more light on like that, you know, ground con context plus trust building, and then how do we kind of proceed from there? That it, it would be great. So over to you, Kuna. Um, in terms of trust building and also getting stakeholders on, on board, I think a very important part is to look at uh, upstream actors in the supply chains. Um, the SMEs, farm workers, including women workers, um, are a fundamental group to um, the, either stand or lose um, or gain a great deal, depending on how companies and governments choose to transition. Uh, geography, uh, for example, can limit the ability sh to shift, such as uh, land suitable for livestock, but not for growing crops. Uh, communities uh, dependent on land suitable for livestock will struggle if that principal economic activity disappears. And other issues such as infrastructure and transportation costs. Um, so starting with the most upstream actors in supply chains, um, SMEs and farm workers, and there is a whole other ecosystem at the upstream level of the supply chains. There are many other stakeholders at risk that need to be acknowledged. This, of course, also includes the sub-industries uh, supporting the livestock sector and other equipment and services for the livestock sector and, and the communities and trade associations, uh, veterinary professions uh, and the pharmaceutical industry supporting the livestock uh, sector other other than food um, supply chain actors for leather producers or garments and other byproducts of the uh, livestock sector, all of whom will naturally naturally be very protective of their in interest in the livestock sector. So it will be very important to get them on board in open dialogue and engaging and engagement for transition. Otherwise, you will experience a lot of resistance or trying to manage different perspectives and or misinformation. Um, and Claire just gave an example of the Dutch government earlier on. Um, so we can expect a major backlash uh, for scrutiny and uh, as well, and, uh, and so planning um, and road mapping to include these stakeholders right from the start and ensuring the social remedies needed to make those thrive and to host communities and to the workers. I think that's what I would strongly recommend from the upstream area. Thanks, Kunal. That was such a well-rounded answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think there's some real, real value there for, for organizations that are looking to kind of get into this kind of work. Um, and, and I think, Kate, when, when you were speaking about uh, antimicrobial resistance, and I feel we've always kind of spoken about it as an issue of like what this means, um you know what this means for animals as well as human beings so how how can we build a better case i feel like for once i think that's the most weak linkage we have like i don't think people generally think of antimicrobial resistance when we talk about food systems overall but how do we build a case for reducing antimicrobial resistance and how do we also target something like the pharma company if we do um do do that so yeah and Given given that we just had you know Corona and then we're possibly saying that bird flu is going to be the next uh, you know next big pandemic, how do we kind of link these things together in our policy work? Uh, of course, with the focus on EMR. Sure, thank thanks, Shweta. Um, essentially, currently there's two sort of different approaches either side of the Atlantic. So in Europe, um, which I think is taking the right approach. Um, they're basically uh, sequentially um, requiring the phase out of certain use usages of antibiotics. So um, they led the phase out for antibiotics used for growth promoting, and now they've just earlier this year led the phase out for um, <clears throat> antibiotics used for prevention or prophylaxis. This signals um, the direction of travel uh, and of course the imports and so forth um, there has there is some impact as well on the other side you've got a more the american approach which is being taken up by um, certain countries particularly thailand and elsewhere in the region um, which is more raised without antibiotics um, and whilst this sounds good in principle it's it's not quite what it is labelled to be. So there are certification systems, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there are no antibiotics in the animal's lives, or even if there are, it doesn't mean there's no antimicrobial resistant or resistant um, superbugs. And so, and even studies have shown that 
uh, from farmers to consumers to veterinarians, um, this can be misleading. So in a, in a way to try and reduce the consumption of antibiotics in livestock, which of course is three quarters of the global use, um, there are a range of um, uh, interventions. One of them is certainly raising the welfare standards of uh, animals on those farms and the systems. And by doing that, the Netherlands reduced their antibiotic use in poultry by 13% by moving to predominantly um, slower growing breeds, of chickens, meat chickens. Other countries have done this through um, uh, phasing out um, uh, painful procedures in pigs, for example. Uh, and certainly again, the Europe's led by setting targets and I would have to emphasize policy and targets that um, you know, countries nationally work towards, companies to work towards and that sort of thing. So also what we're seeing in company engagement is policies uh, where they're mirroring these um, usually uh, the, the better European approach. In terms of targeting pharmaceutical companies, um, this is, this is interesting and challenging because they have their own sort of uh, alliance, which purports to be, of course, in the best interests of reducing antimicrobial resistance. They want to, on the one hand, sell more antibiotics and other, other drugs, of course, but on the other hand, they need to safeguard their um, the uh, effectiveness of those drugs. So there's no point in them trying to sell drugs that are, are not uh, effective. So, uh, however, I think, you know, the largest producer of antibiotics um, or the precursors to them is China. Uh, and then um, the rest of the world is buying various things. But when we look at um, the top 10 pharmaceutical companies, and, and we did look at this um, previously, uh, globally, they have only 2% of the market in China. So if we're not considering the top um, antibiotic pharmaceutical companies in China, we're missing the game. Uh, so I think... Yeah, there's a long way to go, um, but I think policy and, and legislation in some ways is, is leading. And then, of course, by consumers actually um, having very clear labelling, questioning um, from that perspective. And then, of course, uh, the supply chain approach, is, which is what we're mostly engaged with, both upstream and downstream, trying to recognise their responsibility and driving change. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kate. I think, again, like I think well rounded and there's some, something for us to kind of uh, take forward. Um, we do have like about, say, 15 minutes and we need about two or three for a closing. So maybe we could just move to the Slido questions, which I think anyone, please do feel free to come in. If they're not asked to a particular uh, speaker, anyone feel free to kind of jump in and answer them. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll try and go by order if that question has already been answered, I'll skip it. Uh, but maybe we can begin with the first one, which is that how can people be convinced of the ill effects of animal product consumption on health, given the very high cultural relevance that these foods hold in Asia? Um, anyone can like try and answer that. I don't know, Vince, if you want to take a shot at that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, having what was it again, Shweta? Right. So the question is just that how can we convince people of the ill effects of consuming animal products, given that not only does it have like a nutritional kind of, uh, you know, uh, element, but it also has like high cultural relevance. Like we do associate food with, you know, a higher degree of uh, economic superiority, uh, you know, or a higher degree of kind of aspiration. It's very, the, the value of like um, animal-based products is very aspirational. So how do we then convince people to kind of move away from them? I uh, I just want to like add to that and uh, just to give them some context. Like for example, um, my family, they're all meat eaters, yeah? And uh, they're Muslim and they love their kebabs and whatever. But uh, every time we have, I'm a vegetarian myself, but every time we have this conversation, they make fun of me or they're like, you know, you're just being brainwashed. And this is just one family, but this is reflective of so many people around us for dairy and for meat consumption. So how do we work around that? Thanks. Thanks for that explanation. Um, Vince, yeah. do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that um, uh, additional context. It's always been challenging, you know, especially looking at a behavioral change campaign. But at the same time, um, I think when we look at the what is currently lacking within the, the context of animal impacts or, or, or impacts of um, animal meat consumption to, to health, uh, to a certain extent, 
what is also lacking with the, the equation is that these animals are sentient beings. So they have the capacity to feel, they have the, you know, um, uh, that one. But at the same time, if you are going to concretize the, 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 the impact of um, meat consumption on health, we are also looking at peripheral contributing factor that um, brought about by, by factory farming that will basically aggravate the, uh, your health. For example, uh, if you are going to totally stop your uh, consumption of, uh, of meat, but at the same time factory farming continues to operate, it will still continue to degrade um, the, the environment where we are, where we are you know, uh, leaving the pollution uh, health aspect, uh, antimicrobial resistance, among others. So there's a lot of things on how we are going, uh, entry points and how we are going to convince that, but at the same time, uh, looking at health, but there are other aspects as well in, in looking at um, convincing uh, individuals or groups to wean away from meat consumption. But at the same time, I think uh, addressing also the myth, um, we, we should also approach this in the context of whole food systems approach. So when we say like alternative protein, it's not, we're not just talking about, you know, processed product, but at the same time, we are looking at the whole food system, the staple food that people are actually consuming, which is more um, sustainable and basically uh, addresses and, you know, more uh, health friendly to, to the individuals. And there are trends that, that, that we can look at currently right now. That Thanks. Thank you for that, Vince. Um, I'm going to skip the second question and go to another question that was just asked, which um, which I'm not sure if I can see right now, which was just that I, I which was to you, Cleo, which was that how do we uh, how do we like do we really have time for a gradual transition towards more sustainable ways of feeding the world and growing population? Or are we like, you know, are we in a state of emergency and how do we how do we tackle that? Yeah, thanks. I saw that question and it's a really good one and a challenging one. Um, I I think the answer is a bit context specific. Uh, it probably depends a bit in different countries. For instance, in the Netherlands, clearly the government realized there was no more time for a gradual uh, transition and um, no government wants to have to take the decisions that the Netherlands took, which are hugely uh, unpopular. Uh, have, have led to a lot of resistance. Um, but they waited until it was too late, until they had no other option than to go uh, down this kind of um, very disruptive um, pathway for farmers. Um, and so I guess my main message is that we do have an opportunity now and stakeholders in, in every part of the world really have an opportunity to, to think these issues through. Of course, we need to be transitioning quickly for that for our health and uh, for the environment if we transition if we try to do it too quickly um, there might be adverse consequences in terms of uh, just societal um, objections protests we've seen that in other areas as well like energy prices the gilet jaune, jaune protests in france um, so I do think it is important to, to take the time to consult with stakeholders and, and to um, make the transition as managed as possible. Uh, obviously, at the moment, we're, we're doing the opposite, right? Most governments are invest, continue to heavily subsidize intensive uh, animal agriculture. Uh, a lot of governments in the EU, they pay for advertising campaigns to advertise meats. In the Netherlands, there's just been a campaign launched uh, to sort of um, see the Netherlands as a meat country and for us to embrace that vision. So we're actually uh, in many ways doing the opposite from what we're meant to be doing. So even a gradual shift away from that would already be incredibly helpful as opposed to locking in um, pathways that are unsustainable. But I, I take the point that we need to get started as soon as possible um, to make this as least disruptive and as sustainable as possible. Thanks, Cleo. I think we were just at a conference and we the, the way we said it was let perfect not become the enemy of the better, you know, and I guess we need to move somewhere. Uh, I think another really interesting question that came up, and I'm sorry, uh, Pavitra, that I'm not going according to like the questions that are on slide and it makes your job a little harder. Um, but I think this question maybe goes to Guna. Uh, it says, how responsive are government bodies 
in different countries when it comes to labor rights and labor rights specifically in the food system space? Uh, and is there any, do we have any cases of governments taking a positive stand towards uh, labor rights in the food system space? Um, am I unmuted? Yeah. Um, the responses, I think, vary with regards to um, labor issues in food production. Um, I'll start with the U.S. government um, with the withhold release orders imposed on specific businesses in certain countries found to have false labor situation in the supply chains, including in Asia. Um, and, and then how business and governments in those countries have responded to make improvements to prevent loss of export imports. The EU uh, recently adopted uh, a recent adoption of the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, uh, CSDD, uh, is another powerful instrument pushing governments and businesses to improve uh, labor rights um, for, for trade with the EU. And general, generally in Asia, countries like in Thailand and Japan are looking at due, due diligence guidances uh, for their businesses to ensure supply chains are not disrupted in their environmental and social uh, requirements. But for just transitions, we're only beginning to start this discussions in, in the energy sector, let alone with agriculture and major global brands. So uh, um, I don't really have specific government uh, uh, examples for just transitions, but but um, if you look at labor rights issues, um, um, there are plenty of examples when it comes to women and migrant workers, uh, uh, which has been a really uh, well-developed and complex area. Uh, a lot of work has gone on with the, uh, with the International Organization for Migration and the International Labor Organization, many of whom we work with, as well as with global brands that uh, we work with um, across very different sectors to ensure uh, uh, social compliance and, and raising labor standards in their supply chains um, uh, across the various industries. And again, um, it really involves um, in, uh, involving the SMEs and, and the supplier businesses uh, in those discussions, uh, as well as us engaging with the governments in those countries. And so far we have engaged with uh, Malaysia and Thailand for Southeast Asia, uh, as well as Japan and, and Taiwan. We used to have roundtables in Myanmar as well, but at the moment that's a bit of a tricky situation, but um, there we are. And generally governments have been very responsive. They want to improve their conditions because, uh, because it's a trading issue for them and, and income just generating uh, for them. Yeah. Right. I think that, that that's interesting for me to know. Uh, and I guess for all of us to know. I guess that's all the time we have for questions now. Uh, and I just wanted to maybe offer everyone like just final closing thoughts, like, you know, one sentence or less. And I think the question really would be that how can this issue of a just livestock transition gain traction in Asia? What should our, like, if there is one thing that we should do for that issue to gain traction in, in Asia, what would it be? Um, and how, how do we kind of go about it? Just one, one sentence or less, because we've got about three minutes. Um, Cleo, can I, uh, Vince, do you want to go first? Amazing. All right, since yeah, you already thank unmuted. You. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So I think we need to have like an, uh, an integrated cohesive approach to for a just livestock transition. Integrated means intersections with other uh, relevant socioeconomic and political issues and contexts in the issue. Thanks. Thanks, Vince. Um, Cleo, can I pass it over to you? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just generally speaking, and I think um, the specifics of this will depend per, per country, per region, et cetera. Um, but the two main elements that I see to uh, a just transition in this space is, is first of all, government policy and governments. We're not on a level playing field at the moment. We're actually the opposite. Like these sectors, the industrial livestock sector has many advantages that are making it incredibly hard to transition. So we need to address that. Um, but also, I think we really need civil society to be much more vocal about this topic. I think we've been quite quiet on this topic for a very long time, I partially because this is quite a sensitive topic, it, it affects cultural and societal norms, um, and we need uh, civil society to do this on a cross-cutting level, so not just environment, not just health, not just animal welfare, but really to come together uh, also with the social sectors, because 
first of all, we're much stronger when we do that together, but also we, we help uh, avoid any adverse unintended consequences that might occur if we look at these issues too much in a silo. Thanks, Cleo. Uh, over to you, Guna, and maybe then Kate and then Pushkar, but just like two minutes. Yeah. I think um, it's about supporting the development of more um, evidence-based uh, data to support our work um, and also not being afraid to invite your adversaries and your most difficult opponents for open dialogue, uh, it in business, in government, um, and other critics in uh, academia, as well as civil societies or and, and trade unions who can be sometimes a bit tricky to work with. So it'd be important to, to really try to network and find connections with them and really listen to them, listen to what their concerns are, uh, and to see how we can address all those um, areas. Yeah. Thanks, Gunna. Kate? Thanks. Um, having clear goals, um, I think, and I know this is something obviously 50 by 40 you have tried to achieve, um, uh, but there might need to be some, some milestones amongst that, but including all the elements of just transition and, and so forth, so that we're all sort of pulling in the same direction. And the other thing I'd say is clearly we need uh, the movements trying to hook into the climate discussion, which is crucial, and health. Uh, because from a consumer perspective, it's health that's really driving consumer choices predominantly still in Asia. Um, and it's going to take a long time to build a movement, albeit important, um, but at least reflecting uh, using drivers that we know are, are driving the system uh, and working with those. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Final words over to you, Pushkar, just where we're on time, uh, so as, as briefly as we can. Yeah. yeah. Unless and until we start printing the carbon footprint and the water footprint of each each food, people won't understand what what they're trading, what the trade-off is. All right. Uh, Mariam, I would <laughs> please see if this helps with your family. You know, please ask them if they would like a plate of kebab or, you know, perhaps 100 liters of water for the next few days. That will get them thinking. Thank you so unless much. Until, yeah, yeah. Unless and until people understand the water that goes into one liter of milk or one kg of cottage cheese or whatever, you know, they they are yeah. not going to get around to you know contemplating what's in store. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Thanks, Thank Pushkar. So that was our session for today. I hope this was exciting and interesting to everyone who was here. Um, I particularly thought there was a lot of conversation on how do we build up from here intersectionality and integration, which many of us are working on already, um, and how do we kind of build economic, political, civil society will behind this. So, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Mm -hmm.